second week back from vacation, and uh, one of the things that, you know when you go on vacation, uh, and you, like, this is our family trip, we go to see people, and, and you haven't seen them for a long time, and, and when the kids are little, it's like every year they've grown a foot since the last time, it's, oh, you're so cute, and you pinch their cheeks and all that kind of stuff, and, and now um, all of what used to be my little nieces and nephews are all um, much bigger and older now, and a lot of, some of them have kids, and and I still like to, I love, look forward to talking to them about their experiences from the past year. And even though they're not growing this way anymore, they're still growing like in, in their lives. And, and so just listening to a, a lot of stories. And, and um, there was this theme as I'm just talking with different people this week. Uh, one of my nephews, like many of uh, people from my uh, family, is an, is an educator, is a teacher and about his past year in the school, and just as like, he said the same things, the same things happening in New York that's happening here. It's like, just kids are, kids are just in a, in a hard place, and, and parents are struggling, and, and they don't know what to do with them, and, and teachers are trying to figure out how you take a seventh grader who's now a ninth grader, or a ninth grader who's now eleventh grader, but missed two years of socialization, how to help them connect, and, and it's, it's just, it's crazy. And then um, my, my new um, father-in-law, uh, my mother-in-law got married again, and, and uh, he was in, um, an educa- in education for like four decades, and is retired, but went back to help out in the school, and, and he's talking, you know, just how things have changed over, over four decades of education, and kind of the same thing, it's just, it's, you know, I don't even, how do you help people now? And he's kind of, I don't even want to do this anymore. And I talked to one of my nephews, and, and he's a car salesman. And, and two years ago, he loved his job selling cars. And I actually think he was a, he's a really decent human being. If you're ever going to buy a car from a car salesman, he's the guy you'd want to buy a car from. He's just like, you know, I used to like my job, but, but now it's like, it used to be if I had 10 customers, I, I'd have one that was kind of surly and hard to, to work with. His, now I have 10 customers, nine of them. Are, are, are problematic, and it's just, he says, the job is just harder than it used to be, and I don't really know, I don't really like it anymore. I have a niece who's a, a manager of a Walmart, and she's lamenting, they, like a lot of people, she can't get people to, um, they can't get enough employees to, to run the Walmart store, and the people that do run the Walmart store, they can't get them to show up every day to, to work, and the people who don't show up don't necessarily always show up, like, understanding that the work they're doing is mattering to the company that they work for, the people that are signing their paychecks. And, and so there's all kinds of frustrations in that. I have um, Deb uh, has a cousin who's a, a nurse in a um, correctional facility. She works in a jail. And she was in a hospital before, and she says, I actually, I feel like the jail is the safest place to be right now. It's like everybody you talk to has some real-life version of the world has gone mad. Amen? Right? Everybody has some real-life version of the world has gone bad. Most people, I think, believe that. And many people lament it, and a lot of people are afraid of it. It's like, where does this, where does this go? How does this end? When it just seems like everything is crazy, everything is, is off the rails. And, and I think for a lot of us, it feels like a runaway train. It's like, I don't know where it's going, and it doesn't seem like I can do anything to stop it. It's like out of my control. It's out of everybody's control. It's just going wherever it's going to go, and it's going to land wherever it's going to land. There's nothing that we can do about it. Next week, I'm going to go back to um, our, and finish up our series, uh, our I Believe series, and, and do the last uh, portion of the Apostles' Creed, the, the ministry of the Holy Spirit. But before we go there, I'm going to spend um, one more week to, this morning on, um, in the Psalms. Uh, when I introduced the series on the Psalms um, a couple of months, a few months ago, I called it Faith in the Trenches, right? The, the Bible is God's word to us. The Psalms are, are people's prayers, people's cries back to God. And so we're going to look this morning at Psalm 120. If you uh, look at Psalm 120 in, in your Bible, um, the, at the before it, those words that are above it, a lot of the psalms come with, with titles or some kind of description that we usually just ignore or read past. Psalm 120 is a song of ascents. A song of ascents. 
If you look in your Bible, Psalm 100, beginning at Psalm 120 and through Psalm 134 are all called a song of ascents. Three times a year, Israel made prescribed journeys up to the city of Jerusalem for their religious festivals. Wherever they were coming from, Jerusalem was up. It was an ascent. They were going up to the city of Jerusalem. And these psalms, the Psalms of Ascent, Psalm 120 through 134, was the playlist for their road trip. These are the songs that they sang along the way as they're making their journey up to Jerusalem for their festivals. The psalms cover a lot of the essential parts of a life in relationship with God. Just the the stuff of everyday things, if you walk with God, if you live in a relationship with him, um, the things that that you encounter in the course of your life. I didn't say this last week. I actually, I preached from Psalm 127 last week. If you do your math, Psalm 127 lies between 120 and 134. So last week's psalm was a song of a sense. What did we talk about? We talk about work, where we spend a third of our week, every week, right? This is everyday stuff. We talked about rest, where we like to spend a third of our week. Hopefully, you know, at least some portion of we get some, for some rest when we go to bed. We talk about um, raising kids, stuff of everyday life. Psalm 120, the first song in the playlist, starts where we are. Starts where we are. I, I love this about God. We're all on a journey. We're all beginning from some point in our life where we were born, and there's some point in our life when we are going to die, and we're someplace today in between the beginning and the end. And along the way, we can not know God, we can forget God. We can stray from God, but wherever we are on the journey, God always starts with us where we are today. Where we are today. And that's just good news, right? Because we're not where we're going to be and we're not where we were. The only way, the only place we can meet God is where we are, and that's where God comes. You see this over and over again. Adam and Eve, right? He places them in the Garden of Eden and gives them their directives, and they fail. They walk away from God. They, they turn away from God, and now they're hiding in the bushes. Where does God meet them? He comes to the garden where they're hiding. Abraham is the father of faith. Abraham and his wife, Sarah. God called Abraham when he was a wandering Arab man. He was just a guy wandering around taking care of his sheep. And God met Abraham where he was and says to him, I want you to go someplace else. When he called Moses, Moses was a fugitive. He had run away from home because he had killed killed an Egyptian. And and now he's been gone for for decades and he's, he's knee deep in sheep dung, far away from home, when God encounters him in a burning bush. You go through the stories of Jesus, and as he meets his disciples, where does he meet them? He meets Peter and James and John and Andrew at the shore because they're fishermen. He meets them where they are. He meets Matthew at his tax collector's booth because Matthew's a tax collector. That's where he is, wherever you are today. That's where God meets. That's where the psalm starts, where we are. So where is the psalmist? We're starting where he is. Where is he at? He says in verse 1, I call on the Lord in my distress. Where is the psalmist? He's in distress. It's where the story begins. The psalmist is in a place in life where it feels like the world's gone mad, like the train's, like it's a runaway train, and he's at a loss, and that's where it begins. In my distress. Save me, Lord from lying lips, and from deceitful tongues. Where the psalmist is, save me, Lord, from lying lips and and deceitful tongues. God, I don't know who to trust. I don't know where to turn. And boy, does life feel like that right now? 
who, who can be trusted? Who, who can we look to and know that when they speak, they're actually telling us the truth? And some of the most disruptive lies in our life are the ones that we tell ourselves. Woe to me, the psalmist says. Woe to me that I dwell in Meshach, that I live among the tents of Kedar. Now this is interesting because the psalmist, right, this is in a time like before um, Boeing 747s and 57s and 67s and Airbuses existed, right? Everywhere you went, you walked. And Meshach was a thousand miles from where the psalmist lived. He had never been to Meshach. He was not living in Meshach. And Kedar was a nearby tribe with a barbaric reputation. It's poetry. The psalmist is actually, in, in poetry, he's not saying that I live in Meshach and I live among the tribe of, of Kedar. He's saying, I live in a world of strangers, people I don't know, people I don't understand, people are far away, and I live in a world of danger. I don't belong here. And yet, this is where I'm at. And to be honest, I've kind of made myself at home here. Woe to me that I dwell in Meshach that I live among the tents of Kedar. This is where I'm at. Verse 6. Too long, too long have I lived in this place. Too long have I lived among those who hate peace. But when I, I am for, I'm sorry, too long have I lived among those who hate peace. I am for peace. But when I speak they are for war. I'm living among these people, and I'm for peace. Speaking for peace, but they're for war. I'm reading Andy Stanley's book, um, latest book is called "Not in It to Win It." And in the book, uh, Andy is lamenting how our cultural divisions and the ways that we deal with them have infiltrated the church. That that the church is fighting over things, the same things, and in the same ways that people outside the church are fighting over them. And a lot of them in the political realm. And And he makes this case, he says, when the church takes sides in these cultural wars, that we effectively cut off half the population from the kingdom of heaven. We're we're saying, if if we say, if we're going to take a side and we're on this side and we know that if we take this side, that side is going to dismiss and disregard everything we have to say because we're on this side and they're on that side and that's how the world is, that we will have no life impact on half of our population. And, And Andy doesn't say this here, but he said it elsewhere. He says, Jesus didn't come to take sides. He he came to take over. He he came not to establish a right-wing government or a left-wing government, Republicans or Democrats or socialists or communists or democracy. He, He came to establish the kingdom of heaven. And he exhorts the church to abandon this cultural war war motif. Stop talking about being at war with the world. Reminding us that Jesus says, I give you a new commandment. A new commandment. The old commandment was love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. He says, I'm going to give you a new commandment, which is only a slight variation with a very profound difference from the old commandment. Instead of loving your neighbor as yourself, some of you don't love yourself very well. He says, I want you to love your neighbor as I have loved you. 
Some people call it, the, the old rule was the golden rule. He says, this is the platinum rule. Now I'm, I'm the standard for the way that I want you to love other people as I have loved you. How did he love? Tenaciously, relentlessly, persistently, sacrificially. He didn't go to war with the Roman government. He actually submitted to them and allowed them to execute him. He had all the angels in heaven at his disposal that he could have called down. But he didn't fight back. He surrendered. And so Andy's case, hey, stop warring at each other and love each other in grace and forgiveness and patience and kindness sacrificially. Lay down the arms. Stop fighting. And when you do that for 218 pages, it can kind of start to sound kind of judgy towards those who are doing it. And at the end of the day, I almost started to feel like Andy is like attacking, doing the very same thing that he's asking the church not to do. That even when we're advocating for peace, it can end up in a battle. And have I had that experience, right? Even when advocating for peace, we can still end up at war. It's from there that the psalmist calls out, God, I'm living in a world of strangers and dangers. And every time I try and do the right thing, the wrong things happen. Save me, Lord. Save me, Lord. I've hit rock bottom. I've bounced a couple times. I can't do it myself. I can't fix it myself. Save me, Lord. Now, where I'm at is unfamiliar and it's uncomfortable. And I want out. Save me, Lord. I wonder if, if where I started this morning, right, if that's where you're at and feeling like the world has gone mad and it's a run, runaway train and, and every day you're kind of like caught up in the anxiety and the stress and, and the confusion of all that, if you would just stop this morning and just say, save me, Lord. The journey to a new place. God meets us where we are, but the journey to a new place begins with no more to where I'm at. No more. This is, where I'm, this is where I'm at. This is where I've been, Lord. But I don't want to be here anymore. No more. The word that the Bible uses to describe saying no more to where we're at and saying yes to God is the word repentance. Repentance. The Christian life, the Christian walk, the Christian faith always begins with this word. When John the Baptist entered the scene and he was paving the way, preparing the way for the Lord, right? His, his message was, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Jesus' first words, right? He's born in Bethlehem and he grows up and he's baptized and he goes out into the wilderness, and he's tempted, and he comes back, and he begins his ministry, and his first words, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. And Jesus lives his life, and, and does his ministry, and, and then does his work on the cross, and death, and resurrection, and ascends into heaven, and sends his Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit has now been poured out in the church, and, and Peter stands up on, on the, the, the first day of church post-Pentecost, and, and speaks to the masses that are gathered there. And the first word that he calls into action is, repent. 
and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins. Repent. Repentance is not an emotion. It's not feeling sorry for your sins or bad about what you've done. It's a decision to change direction. To repent is literally to turn around. This is where I'm at. This is where I've been going. This is where I've been thinking. This is how I've been feeling. And I'm going to stop in my tracks. I'm going to go the other direction. When the psalmist says, save me, Lord, he's saying, I've been doing this, going that direction, and I'm stopping, and I'm turning to you, Lord. Save me, Lord. And the psalmist says, and he answers me. I'm not sure, as I read the text, what the answer is. Because if you read the psalm, it begins um, with, I'm in distress, and it ends with the word war. So we start in distress, and we end at war. But somehow, in the midst of this, the psalmist said, I cried out, save me, Lord, and the Lord answered me. In some way, the psalmist is certain that God has responded. God always meets us where we are. But when he meets us where we are, and you see these stories played out again, the same stories over and over and over again, when God meets people where they are, he doesn't leave them where they are. He calls them out to another place. When you turn around, cry out to God, he says, okay, here we go. This is where the journey begins. Now we're going to another place. He called Adam and Eve out of the shrubs. He says, whoa, those fig leaves aren't getting the job done. So he gives them some animal skins to cover them up. Abraham and Sarah, I want you to leave your country. I want you to leave your family. He doesn't give them real clear direction. He says, I want you to go to the land that I will show you. But you're leaving. You're going somewhere else. When he meets Moses in the burning bush, Moses, I want you to turn around from where you've run, and I want you to go back to Egypt and deliver them from their bondage. The psalmist is beginning a journey, and he says to God, I'm ready now to go there. Tired of where I'm at, I'm ready to go there. And then jumping back to the middle of the psalm, he says, what will he do to you? And what more besides, you deceitful tongue? He will punish you with a warrior's sharp arrows, with burning coals of the broom bush. God's engaged here. There's hardship, struggle. Hardship comes to us from a lot of different angles. Sometimes from the natural consequences of our actions. Those consequences can sear like burning coals of the broom bush. Sometimes the result of the actions of others can pierce like sharp arrows. We live in a broken world, right? Sometimes it's the stuff we do. Sometimes it's the stuff that other people do to us. And sometimes it's just because the world has been wrecked by sin. And all of those things visit hardship upon us. But even when it's not our fault, We always have a choice to make in our response. And and the choice that we make in response to hardship is our responsibility. It's not our fault, but it's still our responsibility. 
And those choices, in the same way that our actions are sent, how we respond to the things that happen to us can move us toward our away from God. If our response is we're going to take matters into our own hands, we're going to, it happened to me, it wasn't my fault, but I'm going to fix it. I'm going to make it right. I'm going to do whatever I have to do. I'm going to get back my get back or whatever, right? I'm going to take control of it. That has consequences too. Or the choice to cry out to God. Again, save me, Lord. And it's the sum of those choices, not just the things that happen because of what we do or because of what other people do to us or because we live in a broken world, but in a broken world, but the, the, some of the, the choices that we make about how we respond to the things that happen to us, that's, that's the story of our lives. It's the decisions that we make every day about where we will go from here, regardless of what we encountered, that determine what our lives will be. I heard this phrase many years ago, and I hate it, and it's true. God will thwart you to save you. God will interrupt your journey in uncomfortable ways to save you from a path of destruction. I think that's why the author of Hebrews says, endure hardship as discipline. Endure hardship as discipline. No matter where it comes from, no matter what the origins of it are, endure hardship, whatever, the, whatever it is, endure it as discipline. Verse 11, it will produce a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Take it. Whatever has come to you, take it. Cry out to God. Invite him into the story. Turn to him. Rely upon him. Endure the hardship as discipline and allow him to use whatever that experience is to train you. And he says, and, and when you've been trained by it, it will produce a harvest of righteousness in your life and peace. Eugene Peterson says, any hurt that puts us on a path to peace is worth it. Any hurt that puts us on a path to peace is worth it. God meets us where we are. Where do we go from here? Take notice. Would you just stop where you are this week? Because we can get so kind of bent on doing life and getting up every day and going through the motions and doing the things that we have to do and going to work and, and making meals and cleaning up and going to, you know, all the stuff that, that we lose track of. Whereas one of the, I love um, vacation because it gives you a chance to stop and say, where am I? What in the world is going on? Take notice of your environment. L listen to the people around you. And the things that they're saying, what are you hearing? Where are we? Are you living in Meshach and among the Keterites? Take notice of where you are. And if you feel like you're on a runaway train, and maybe you've been going so fast you didn't even realize the train was moving, it's like, because you're... You stop and cry out to the Lord, save me, Lord. Save me. And repent. Turn around. And I'm not saying, right, the right thing to do is if you're in a job that's like going crazy, that the right thing to do is to turn around and not go to work. 
or to walk away from your responsibilities, your commitments, but to turn around from the way that you've been handling, the way that you've been managing, the way that you've allowed those things to affect your heart and your spirit, the ways that you've been trying to make them work on your own by yourself, to turn around from that posture of my life, my world according to me. God, the train is running away. I'm going to stop in my tracks and I'm going to turn and cry out, Lord, save me. Turn around. The, the psalmist in Psalm 120 ends, I'm for peace, they're for war. End of psalm. But this is a book, right? It's the songs of ascent. There's 120 through 134. If you go to the next psalm, after he's repented, after he's stopped in his tract, after he says, I, I'm not where I want, to, I want to be, this is what he says. He says, I lift my eyes to the hills. Where will my help come from? I'm realizing I'm not where I want to be. I'm looking around. I'm looking up to the hills. My help is in the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. There's my help. Okay, that's where I'm going now. And if you go, so you start out in 120, I'm not where I want to be. Psalm 121, where am I going to go? My help is in the Lord. Psalm 122, he's now in Jerusalem. He's arrived to the city for the great festival. Temple worship was a foreshadowing of the kingdom of God. Like the Christian life is the same kind of journey. It begins with a recognition that I'm not where I want to be and crying out, who will help me? I lift my eyes to the help. Where will my help come from? My help is in the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. We're moving to it and it's now I'm in the kingdom. I'm in his dwelling place. I'm among him. The short answer of Jesus' invitation to citizenship in God's kingdom was two words. Follow me. Wherever you are, wherever you've been going, I want you to stop in your tracks. I want you to turn around. And he says, I want you to follow me. And, and the journey that begins when we turn and follow Jesus is what we call discipleship. And, and it's what Peter and James and John and Andrew and Matthew, it's what they did when they turned and followed Jesus that became his disciples. Disciples is someone who disciplines their life after their master. The journey that begins when we follow Jesus is a journey of discipleship. And it always involves leaving where we are and going somewhere else. In the, the middle of um, September, when we kick off our fall, uh, we're going to join a number of churches in uh, Lakewood, Bellflower, Paramount, in a journey called organic discipleship. We're going to do, I think it's a six or seven week um, journey together. And it is, it is just going back to the very basics of what it means to respond to Jesus' invitation to follow me. So I want to encourage you, right, to mark, I wish I had the date, it's like it's the third week of September in your calendars. And if you haven't come back yet, Right? Work up your nerves. Start praying. If you haven't been back to church yet, if you haven't been back in the building yet, say, is that the day? Is that the time for me to reconnect with the faith community again? And we'll continue to love you if you're home. And if you're too far away to get here, we'll love you all the same, right? But the life of faith is a life that's lived in relationship. And whether it's here in the sanctuary on Sunday morning or some we need to be connected to the body of Christ, to the family of God. Our lives infused with the power of the Holy Spirit. Our lives live and surrender to God in response to Jesus' invitation. We promote peace in our corner of God's kingdom. Even if the world's a runaway train, right? If we bring the life of God in us into the places that we are, we will be people of peace in that place. And our lives apart from the Spirit of God in a relationship. 
most often will simply add to the chaos. Because like Israel, going back to the very beginning of our message this morning and our call to worship, right? when left to ourselves, we have a way of messing things up. Ten, no, 9.58 this morning. I, I'm in my office every Sunday at 7 to 10. I walk out at 10 and go to the front door and greet people. At 9.58, I just had this sense of, this is not a very good message today. It kind of sounds like a broken record. Like I've been saying the same thing over and over and over again. So I closed my door quick, stopped, and just said another prayer. And said, God, this doesn't feel like a very good message today. It feels like a broken record. And the, the response that I got in my own heart was this. The problem, Tim, is not your message. The problem is you're not believing it. Do we believe what we sing and what we say and who we worship and what we read? Because the world is a runaway train. But we're not on it. We're not on it. And we walk with God. God, help us on our journey. We cry out from where we are, save us, Lord. And if we've cried it a hundred times before or a thousand times before, we say it again, save us, Lord. Thank you that you meet us where we are. Thank you, God, that you don't leave us there. Show us the path that leads to life, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.